during the planning stage of this conference, Murray Rothbard and I discussed what the topics of my lectures should be. And his idea was to assign me to the task of dealing with the problems of the philosophical and methodological foundations of economics and economics in relation to other scientific disciplines. I gladly agree to do this since I'm convinced that such matters are of utmost importance and that only if you, under, if, if you understand these things correctly will one be ultimately prevented from producing nonsense. But it was also my wish to speak on one non-methodological subject, and this topic is socialism, the subject of my lecture today. However, since it is my role here uh, to be the methodologist and philosopher, uh, let me begin even this lecture with some methodological thoughts. They will emphasize once again how important it is to get things right fundamentally, that is, to have a correct epistemology and philosophy of one's discipline unless one wants to go astray and end in some sort of relativistic dogmatism. For every neutral observer, it should be obvious that the following statement is true and recognizable as such almost beyond the shadow of a doubt as an empirical statement. Life under full-blown socialism in countries like the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, Cuba, China, and so on, is miserable as compared to life in Western countries like the US, West Germany, Japan, Switzerland, and so on, which all have a sizable socialist sector too, but where socialism is still much less rampant. The difference is indeed so evident that these all-out socialist countries must resort to ruthless emigration restrictions in order to prevent a massive outflow of the population. West and East Germany illustrate this in the most dramatic way. In this case, where there are no natural language and culture barriers for emigrants, and where there is no institutional problem of getting into West Germany, because it has never had immigration restrictions vis-a-vis -vis East Germany and automatically grants to West German citizenship to every East German. In this case, the outflow of population from the socialist East to the so-called soziale Marktwirtschaft or social market economy of the West took on such proportions that in 1961, East Germany literally had to be turned into a giant prisoner's camp. To keep the population in it, it had to build a system the likes of which the world had never seen before of walls, barbed wire, electrified fences, minefields, automatic shooting devices, watchtowers, dogs and men, almost 900 miles long for the sole purpose of preventing its people from one running away from socialism. The empirical evidence then seems to be crystal clear. To everyone, who is only faintly familiar with real socialism, who has traveled in such countries and engaged, however limited, in some everyday life activities, the cause of all this is equally clear. But almost everyone who is not completely brainwashed by the sophisticated confusion spread throughout the typical liberal university education in the Western countries notices is that there is almost no private ownership in means of production in these countries. Instead, almost all factors of production are commonly owned in precisely the same way as you all own the United States Postal Service and I own the Deutsche Bundespost in West Germany, the equivalent of the US Postal Service. Why is it then that there are still seemingly serious people who advocate socialism? Why are there still scores of social scientists who still want to put more and more factors of production under social instead of private control? For one thing, of course, they might be simply evil, to use one of Murray's favorite terms. <laughs> Um, they might simply have nothing against misery, especially if it is only misery for others while they themselves are in charge of administering such misery and are well off while doing so. 
But I'm not so much interested in this group because a group which openly propagates lower standards of living in exchange for increasingly deprivatized social and economic life will hardly ever gain much popularity. Rather, I'm interested in that group of advocates for socialism, which advocates socialism because it is allegedly more value productive than capitalism, and who declares a contrary ev evidence that I have cited as being beside the point or as merely accidental. I guess I don't have to convince you that this is a more popular position among our socialist friends. One immediately senses that something is seriously wrong here, how can one deny that the Russian experience is decisive evidence against socialism? How can people get away with taking such an absurd stand? Uh, the answer, it seems to me, is that they have invented it to make use of a respectable sounding philosophy. And this philosophy is the philosophy of empiricism. Empiricism is what gives this absurd position the credibility that it still has. Thus, if one wants to attack socialism from an economic point of view, one must foremost attack empiricism because empiricism offers the intellectual means that make it possible to shield the idea of socialism as being a more efficient system of production from being refuted by the Russian experience once and for all. The Austrian critique of socialism is such a simultaneous attack on socialism and empiricism. It explains that the connection between socialism and lower living standards is a necessary one. Why the Russian experience is not accidental and why the empiricists attempt to make it appear so is based on straightforward intellectual errors. How can empiricism deny the decisiveness of the Russian experience? Recall what I said about the fundamental assumption of empiricism. First, one cannot know anything about reality with certainty, a priori. And because of this, secondly, an experience can neither prove that there definitely exists a relation between two or more events, nor that a relation definitely does not exist. Assuming this as a starting point for the moment, it is quite easy to see how one can get around the conclusion that socialism is empirically refuted as a superior social system. Of course, an empiricist socialist would not deny the facts. He would not argue that there is indeed a lower standard of living in, Russian, in Russia and Eastern Europe than in the US and in Western Europe. But within the framework of the empiricist belief system, he could easily deny that based on such experiences, a principled case against socialism could be formulated. Regarding the seemingly falsifying experience with Russia or any other experience that one might come up with, he could easily argue in the following way. Of course, the facts are deplorable, but their outcome has been produced only by some unfortunately neglected and uncontrolled circumstances, which will be taken care of in the future, and then the positive relationship between socialism and a higher standard of living will be revealed. Just wait. Even the seemingly striking evidence from the comparison between West and East Germany could thus be explained away. In arguing, for instance, that the higher standard of living in the West is not due to the fact that in the West significantly more means of production were and still are in private hands, but because of some other reason, because martial aid had come into West Germany while East Germany had to pay reparations to the Soviet Union, or by the fact that from the very beginning, East Germany encompassed Germany's less developed rural agricultural provinces and so never had the same starting point, or that in the eastern provinces, the tradition of serfdom had been discarded much later than in the western ones, and so the mentality of the people was indeed different in both East and West Germany, and so on and so on. Not even the most perfectly controlled experiment, and the German case is something like an experiment, evidently, could ever change this situation 
because it would never be possible to control all the variables that might conceivably have some, inf have conceivably have some influence on the variable to be explained. As a matter of fact, we cannot even know what all the variables are which make up this universe, as this question is permanently open to newly discovered experiences. Thus, the just characterized immunization strategy would work without exception and unfailingly. Moreover, according to the empiricist doctrine, causal links between events cannot be observed. All that can be observed is that certain types of events follow or do not follow each other in time. In other words, there is no way, according to empiricism, that one might categorically rule out certain events as being possible causes for something else. Even the seemingly most absurd things can, provided they have taken place earlier in time, be possible causes, and thus there is no, uh, no number to the end of excuses, so to speak. No matter what the charges brought against socialism are, so long as they are based only on empirical evidence, the empiristically minded socialist could always argue that there is no way of knowing in advance what the results of certain policies will be without actually trying them out and letting experience speak for itself. And whatever the observable results then may be, the original socialist idea, the hardcore of one's research program, as a neo-Popperian philosopher Lakatos would have called it, can always be easily rescued by pointing out some heretofore neglected, more or less plausible variable whose non-control is hypothesized as being responsible for the negative result, with the newly revised hypothesis again needing to be tried out indefinitely. Experience only tells us that a particular socialist policy scheme did not reach the goal of producing more wealth, but it can never tell us if a slightly different one will produce any different results, or if it is impossible to reach the goal of improving the production of wealth by any socialist policy at all. One realizes by this example how dogmatic the empiricist philosophy actually is in spite of its alleged openness and its appeal to experience, empiricism is in fact an intellectual tool to completely immunize oneself against criticism and experience. To adopt it is, so to speak, the attempt to get away with murder. I do not want to engage in a critique of empiricism any longer here, however. The little excursion into methodology was merely intended to indicate how important it is to formulate a principled case against socialism if you want to formulate a case against it at all. And surely such a principled case must be based on praxeology. That is, it must be a case based on a priori argument and reasoning. What does this case look like? Recall that economics as an a priori science of action is based on the incontestable axiom of action and an understanding of the categories implied in action, such as ends, means, cost, profit. And a logical analysis then of the implications that follow if a state of affairs characterized in terms of such categories it is changed in a specified way. Let me first describe in economic terms the difference between socialism and capitalism as the rest, that is, the judgment that socialism is by necessity an inferior system of production follows essentially from this very description. The key concept for any understanding of socialism and in contrast of capitalism is the concept of property. Obviously, there would be no need for the idea of property if there was no scarcity of goods. If, due to a superabundance of goods, my present use and consumption of such goods would neither reduce my own future supply of these goods, nor the present or the future supply of such goods for any other person, then the assignment of property rights to goods would be superfluous. To develop the idea of property rights, then, 
it is necessary for goods to be scarce so that conflicts over the use of these goods can possibly arise. It is a function of property rights to avoid such possible clashes over the use of scarce resources by assigning rights of exclusive ownership or control. Property is thus a normative concept, a concept designed to make a conflict-free interaction possible by stipulating mutually binding rules of conducts or norms regarding the use of scarce resources. Of course, conceptually, there are numerous ways to solve this problem. The capitalist mode of doing this, essentially formulated by John Locke, is this. In order to avoid otherwise inescapable conflicts over the use of scarce goods, it is determined that he who uses a good first before anyone else uses it becomes the goods owner. He decides what to do or not to do with it. And secondly, it is determined that once a good has been first appropriated or homesteaded by mixing one's labor with it, this is the phrase that Locke employs, then ownership in such a good can only be acquired by means of a contractual transfer of property titles from a previous to a later owner. Aggression, on the other hand, is defined according to this idea of property rights in the following way. It is aggression if and only if a person uninvitedly changes the physical integrity of an appropriated good that is, a homesteaded or a contractually acquired good, or if and only if a person restricts the range of uses to which the owner wishes to put such homesteaded or contractually acquired good. An owner can do whatever he wants with his good, so long as he does not interfere or physically damage the goods owned by other persons. This is the idea of private property and the idea underlying the system of pure capitalism or of a market economy. As compared with this, the socialist way of defining property rights is the following one. With respect to consumption goods, there exists private property as just defined. However, with respect to factors of production, that is, those goods that are necessary to produce consumption goods, there is no such thing as private property. Rather, factors of production are socially owned, which is to say, no one, no single person, and no specific group of persons can acquire such goods and exclusively determine to what uses they should be put. And no one, uh, and since no one owns these goods, then of course no one is allowed to sell them. Instead, they are owned collectively. Mankind, so to speak, is their owner, but no specific person or group of persons. The person actually using a factor of production first does not own it any more than a person coming along later. And a person contracting with a previous user of such good does not own it any more than a person who does not contractually agree with some previous owner or previous user. People are only allowed to use factors of production as caretakers or as trustees on behalf of the community of caretakers. And the use they make of such goods is at all times subject to the commands and decisions of this community of caretakers. Now, what does it imply to have such a caretaker economy? What, in particular, does it imply to change from a private property system to a system with socialized means of production or vice versa? There are four intimately related, narrowly defined economic defects and one what I will call a sociological effect implied in adopting socialism rather than capitalism. All of these facts all of these effects can be deduced as logically necessary consequences of adopting the socialist idea of property rights as just described. First, obviously, as compared with a system of private property, socialism implies a redistribution of property rights and hence of income. 
property titles are redistributed away from actual users and producers of means of production and away from those who have acquired these means by mutually consent from previous users and producers and onto a community of caretakers in which, at the very best, every person remains the caretaker of the things that he previously owned. But even in this case, each previous user producer and each contractor would be hurt in terms of income as he would no longer be able to sell the means of production, nor would he be able to privately appropriate the profit from using them. And hence, for him, the value of the means of production would fall. On the other hand, Every non-user, non-producer, and non-contractor of these means of production would be favored by being promoted to the rank of a caretaker of them, with at least a partial say over resources which he had previously neither used, produced, nor contracted to use, and his income would rise. Moreover, there is a redistribution of income away from people who have foregone possible consumption and instead saved up funds in order to employ them productively, that is, for the production of future consumption goods, and who can no longer reap the fruits of such activity privately and onto non-savers who, in adopting socialism, gain a say, however partial, over the savers' funds. Now, since socialism clearly favors the non-user, the non-producer, and the non-contractor of means of production, and mutatis mutandis raises the costs for users, producers, and contractors, there will be fewer people acting in these latter roles. There will be less original appropriation of natural resources whose scarcity is realized, there will be less production of new and less maintenance of old factors of production, and there will be less contracting. For all these activities involve costs, and the costs of performing them have been raised. And there are other alternative courses, courses of action available, such as leisure consumption activities, which at the same time and by the same token have become relatively less costly and thus are more attractive to actors. Along the same line, because everyone's investment outlets have dried up, as it is no longer permissible to convert private savings into private investment, there will therefore be less saving and more consuming, less work and more leisure. After all, you cannot become a capitalist anymore, and so there is at least one less reason to save. Needless to say, the result of all this will be a reduced output of exchangeable goods and a lowering of the standard of living in terms of such goods. And since these lowered living standards are forced upon people and are not the natural choice of consumers who have deliberately changed their relative evaluation of leisure as compared to exchangeable goods, that is, since it is experienced by them as an unwanted impoverishment, a tendency will evolve to compensate for such losses by going underground, by moonlighting, and by creating black markets. So much for the first economic effect. Secondly, a policy of the socialization of means of production will result in a wasteful use of such means. That is, in a use which at best satisfies second-rate needs and at worst satisfies no needs at all but exclusively increases costs. We owe this insight above all to Mises and his discovery that economic calculation is impossible under socialism. Essentially, the insight is a very simple one, but that does not make it any less important. Since the means of production cannot be sold, there, can, there exist no market prices for means of production. But then the caretaker producers of the socialized means of production can no longer establish the monetary costs involved in using the resources or in making any changes in the production structure. Nor can they compare these costs with their expected mon monetary income from sales. In not being permitted to take any offers from other individuals 
who might see an alternative way of using some given means of production, the caretaker simply does not know what he is missing or what the foregone opportunities are, and he is thus unable to assess the costs involved in doing with the resources whatever he happens to do with them. He cannot discover whether his way of using them or changing their use is worth the results in term of monetary returns or whether the costs involved are actually higher than the returns and so cause an absolute drop in the value of the output of consumer goods. Nor can he establish whether his way of producing for consumer demand is indeed the most efficient one compared to conceivable alternative ways of satisfying the most urgent consumer wants, or if less urgent needs are satisfied at the expense of neglecting more urgent ones, and thereby causing at least a relative drop in the value of goods produced. Without being able to resort unrestrictedly to the means of economic calculation, there is simply no way of knowing. In making it illegal for private persons to bid away means of production from the community of caretakers, a system of socialized production essentially prevents opportunities from uh, essentially prevents opportunities for improvement from being taken up to the full extent that they are perceived. And of course, the larger the consumer market one has to serve is, and the more the knowledge regarding preferences of different groups of consumers, regarding special circumstances of time and place, and regarding technological possibilities is dispersed among different individuals, the more likely it is that people would indeed perceive such opportunities for improvement. But by being restricted in taking them up, more misallocations of means of production with wastes and shortages as the two sides of the same coin must ensue. And it is hardly needed to point out that this too, of course, contributes to impoverishment. The third effect. Socializing means of production causes an overutilization of such factors. It causes them to fall into disrepair and to become vandalized. A private owner who has the right to sell the factors of production and keep the receipts privately will because of this try to avoid any increase in production which occurs at the expense of the value of the capital employed. His objective is to maximize the value of the, product, of the products produced plus that of the resources used in producing them because he owns both of them. The situation for a caretaker is entirely different. He faces an altogether different incentive structure. Because he cannot sell the means of production, his incentive not to produce at the expense of an excessive reduction in capital value is, if not completely gone, at least reduced. Rather, the caretaker, the caretaker's inability to sell the means of production implies that for him the incentive is raised to increase the monetary or psychic income that can be received from using the factors of production in any given way at the expense of the value embodied in this capital. To the extent, for instance, that he sees his income dependent on the output of goods produced, his incentive will be raised to increase this output regardless of what this implies for the capital used. Or if the caretaker perceives opportunities of employing the means of production not for the official production purposes, but for private purposes, the production of privately used or black market goods, he will be encouraged to increase this output at the expense of capital values. In any case, capital consumption and overuse of existing capital will occur, and increased capital consumption once more, of course, implies relative impoverishment, since the production of future exchange goods will, as a consequence, be reduced. The force effect. Socialism implies a reduction in the quality of the output of whatever it decides to produce. Under a system of capitalism, 
any ordinary business in which the means of production and the output produced with their help is privately owned, and in which all employees perceive this to be the case and hence know that their salaries ultimately depend on the success of their firm, product quality is the firm's main concern. Since the firm can only maintain its position and possibly grow if it can sell its products at a price and in such quantity that costs are at least recovered, and since the demand for the products or services produced depends either on their relative quality or their price, price being one criterion of quality, of course, the producers must be constantly concerned with product quality. And the product quality they must be concerned with is not the quality as defined by some arbitrary technical or expert standard, but rather the quality as defined and perceived by the voluntary buyers of one's product. Things are entirely different under socialism. Here, not only the means of production are socially owned, but the output produced with the help of these factors of production is of course socially owned as well. But this is nothing other than saying that the income assigned to the producers is either totally independent of or at least only rather loosely connected with the evaluations that consumers place on the goods and services which the producers happen to produce. Naturally, this fact is perceived by each and every producer. Yet why then undertake special efforts to improve product quality and give as much consideration to the consumers as a producer under capitalism is forced to do? Instead, producers under socialism will, because of the very institutional setting in which they operate, tend to devote relatively less time and effort to producing according to the demands of consumers and more effort and time will go into doing what they, the producers, but not necessarily what the consumers happen to like. Socialism, in a word, is a system that incites everyone to be lazy. Finally, socialism has an effect on the character structure of, so of the society, the importance of which can hardly be exaggerated. I mentioned earlier that this effect might be more appropriately called a sociological rather than a narrow economic effect, but in spite of this terminological classification, it has, as we will see, dramatic economic implications as well. Socialism leads to a politicization of society, and hardly anything can be worse for the production of wealth than a politicized society. Let me explain this. Socialism at least its Marxist version, with which I am concerned here, is motivated by egalitarianism. Once you allow private property in means of production, you allow differences. If I own resource A, then you do not own it. And hence, our relations regarding this, resources, this resource are different. By abolishing private property, everyone's position vis-a-vis -vis means of production is equalized with one stroke, or so it seems at least. Everyone becomes a co-owner of everything, reflecting everyone's equal standing as a human being. So much for the socialist ideology. Now what about the truth of this claim? Obviously, declaring everyone a co-owner of everything only nominally solves the problem of differences in ownership. It does not solve the real underlying problem, the problem of differences in the power to control what is to be done with what. In an economy based on private ownership, the owner determines what should be done with the means of production. In a socialized economy, this can of course no longer happen as there is no longer any such owner. Nonetheless, the problem of determining what should be done with the means of production still exists and must be solved somehow, provided there is no miraculous harmony of interest and opinions among all people, in which case no problem whatsoever would exist anyway. But rather there is some degree of disagreement. Only one view as to what should be done can prevail in the end, and others must mutatis mutandis be excluded. 
But then again, there must by necessity be inequalities between people. Someone's or some group's opinion must win over that of others. The difference between a private property economy and a socialist one is only how it is determined whose will prevails in cases of disagreement. Under capitalism, this is resolved by original appropriation and contract, that is, he who ha has acquired things first or who acquired them contractually from a previous owner determines. Under socialism, too, differences between controllers and non-controllers necessarily exist. Only in the case of socialism, the pos position of those whose opinion wins or loses is not determined by previous user ownership and the existence of contractual, mutually agreeable exchange, but rather by superimposing one person's will upon that of another disagreeing one. That is, by political instead of economic means. Now, evidently, a person's position in the production structure has an immediate effect on his income be it in terms of exchangeable goods, psychic income, status, or anything else. Accordingly, as people under socialism want to improve their income and want to move into more highly evaluated positions in the hierarchy of caretakers or increase their payments for their presently occupied position, they increasingly have to use their political talents. Depending on the intensity of the desire for higher incomes, people will have to spend less time and effort developing their productive skills and more time and effort improving their political talents. In other words, on the one hand, people will have to increasingly shift out of the role of user, producers, and contractors, and as time goes on, their personalities will be changed. A former ability to perceive and anticipate situations of scarcity, to take up productive opportunities, to be aware of technological possibilities, to anticipate changes in demand, to develop marketing strategies and to detect chances for mutually advantageous exchanges. In short, the ability to initiate, to work, and to respond to other people's needs will, if it is not completely extinguished, be diminished. And along the same line, in response to the very same shift in the incentive structure affected by socialization, people will, on the other hand, increasingly shift into the role of non-users, non-producers, and non-contractors, and place increasing importance on the peculiar skills of a politician. They will make more and more attempts to develop personalities which can successfully manage to assemble public support for their own position and opinion through means of persuasion, demagoguery, and intrigue, through promises, bribes, and threats. And since different people have different degrees of productive and political skills and talents, different people will rise to the top under socialism than would under capitalism, so that one finds increasing numbers of positional changes everywhere in the hierarchy of caretakers. All the way to the top, you will increasingly find people who are incompetent to do the job they are supposed to do. It is no hindrance in a caretaker politician's career for him to be dumb, indolent, inefficient, and uncaring so long as he commands superior political skills, and accordingly, people like this will be found taking care of means of production everywhere. It is hardly worth mentioning that this, too, contributes to the economic impoverishment of society. The U.S. is certainly not as, as socialist as the Soviet Union, but don't we see the disastrous effects of the politicalization of society, of an ever-increasing encroachment on the rights of private property owners by means of politics if we simply look at our own politicians? They give us a pretty good taste of what you can expect to be an all-pervasive feature of life in the East Bloc. And of course, apart from this point, the other impoverishment effects caused by socialism can be observed 
if only on a smaller scale in the US or West Germany as well. Reduced levels of investment because of an ever-increasing socialized or quasi-socialized sector of the economy, the misallocation of resources going hand in hand with this, and the overutilization and vandalization of production factors within this sector, as well as the inferior quality of products and services produced by it. Thank you. Austrian criticisms of socialism. Like I know there was, uh, I believe it was Bakunin attempted to answer von Bavark's uh, criticism of the exploitation theory. Bukharin. 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 Um, I, I, I'm not uh, perfectly familiar with uh, Bukharin's position, uh, but of course uh, that would amount to a uh, um, does that would amount to the task of defending the labor theory of value, I assume, uh, if you want to refute the Böhm Bavarkian uh, criticism of, uh, uh, of Marx. Uh, you could only do that if you could somehow defend the labor theory uh, of value. Um, now, the labor theory of value, uh, as far as I see, is hardly taken seriously by uh, by anyone anymore, um, that of course doesn't mean that it is false, but uh, uh, nonetheless, I mean, this, this, uh, the simple, this simple counter argument uh, uh, would be to, um, uh, to point to certain, um, uh, to certain products which evidently cannot be explained by pointing out uh, or by referring to the amount of work that has uh, gone into them. If you look at the Rembrandt painting and you want to explain uh, how the price of this Rembrandt painting can be one million dollars uh, by counting the numbers of hours that Rembrandt needed in order to paint it, it seems quite evident uh, that that uh, is a pretty absurd stand. Now, Marxists realized this, of course, and introduced the idea that, uh, uh, that there are different types of works. But in uh, using this idea that there are different types of works, a Rembrandt hour is worth 1,000 hours of my work, or whatever it is, uh, then you have to, of course, explain the fact, why is it worth 10,000 times uh, of the value of uh, my work, and you would have to go again, um, in, in order to explain this difference, you would in, uh, have to introduce uh, from the back uh, a, price, a price theory based on value again in order to explain these differences. And indeed, um, this has been done by, uh, by Marx himself in the third volume of uh, of the capital, it has been noticed by almost everyone who read that carefully that um, um, that he had plenty of deviations from the original labor theory of value that he was forced uh, again and again to give up the labor theory of value in order to explain actual prices. The idea that they resorted to was then to say somehow, see, we don't even want to explain actual prices anymore. We are only interested in explaining some sort of long run thing that is happening around which the actual prices uh, fluctuate. But as far as I can see, um, even in Marx's own writings, the refutation of the labor theory of value is already contained. Um, also, uh, Murray? I'd like to add something to that. Uh, Bukharin uh, went to von Bonner's seminar, studied for a year there at least, in order to learn enough about Austrian economics to refute it. He then went uh, back to Russia, wrote a book attacking Austrian economics, and participated in the Communist Revolution, led the way in communizing the, uh, Russia in, in, in 1919, and after the communist, the so-called war communism, which is really just communism, collapsed totally, and Lenin beat the path back to mixed economy, quasi-capitalism, Bukharin became a major theoretician of so-called right deviationism, which meant essentially back to the free market. 
So I like this thing. Of course, it's then wiped out by Stalin later. But I like the psychical harm that the bomb record got his final revenge. <laughs> <laughs> The Mises Lange debate. I mean, very hard time because Lange said that uh, Mises' critique was okay, but only to the extent that it pointed out to the need to make socialism efficient. How would you refute this uh, pro socialist view? I, I think the, uh, Mises, Mises pointed out uh, that, that his, his recommendation amounted to saying that um, you can, of course, play. Capitalism. You can uh, you can pretend that there is private property, but there is no real private property, and uh, and only if you have real private property and not just private property, so to speak, or as play money, uh, then the results of um, uh, uh, the, the, then you can match indeed the um, the economic performance of uh, capitalism. Yeah. Uh, you, you spoke of needing to defeat empiricism to defeat socialism. If I understood you correctly, then, because this yeah. hanging on of socialism depends on this inability to falsify socialism as a working theory. Can you not work that the other way that in socialism the attempt to defeat capitalism, the reason against it, it's proved itself a failure and so forth? Capitalism also non falsifiable by the empiricist, so neither can reason the other out. And a, a follow-up, if you will, on that. Let, let me come back. Go ahead with that one, and then let's come back on one. Um, uh, two, two points would have to be made here. Um, for one thing, of course, we have to realize that what Marxists criticize as the results of capitalism is normally the results of statism. It is not. We don't crit most of most of the things that Marxists have in mind when they criticize capitalism. Unemployment, for instance, is not the result of the working of a free capitalist economy, but is the result of minimum wage legislations and things like that. So they actually attack the wrong guy, so to speak. Uh, now, with respect to the other argument, couldn't they try to refute? Uh, some sort of a priori, a priori reasoning pointing out that capitalism is more efficient. There I can simply ask them to come forward with anything. I have not seen anything to this effect by any, by any Marxist who could ever make a, make a point like that. I think I'm saying that, that you, you say that the capitalists can never disprove socialism because they keep appealing to empiricism. There's no way to ultimately falsify it. That can be turned around so that the socialists can never argue against capitalism because there's no experiment that could disprove capitalism either. They're, we're in a morass of indecidability. Think, yeah, I mean, it, you could argue that way if, as an empiricist, you could argue this way against a, a socialist who would uh, who would attack capitalism you could defend capitalism by pointing out uh, if we improve that this way then of course maybe capitalism works better but that only indicates again that we are in a completely relativistic morass if we ever adopt these uh, these rules of uh, discussing one side against the other side each side can defend everything all the way and, and there is never, ever any, uh, any decisive argument that would prove either side r right or wrong. So you, in any case, you would, would be forced somehow to develop arguments that are based on, uh, on a different sort of reasoning than the typical reasoning allowed by empiricists. Let me grant at that stage, could we, in, instead of being able to simply prove that this it's falsifiable theory. Could we, our problem is making a decision between the two. Could we decide on the basis of probable results given the historical experience of the experiments? You know, maybe there were some, some minor adjustments to be made, but on the basis, or the cost basis, probability sort of approach, that if we have to bet on which is right from our experience yeah. so far, we'd be better off betting on Well, that assumes that you can apply probability theory in the social sciences. And that is highly doubtful, because the probability theory uh, assumes that you deal with homogeneous uh, with homogeneous units, and uh, 
with respect to human actions, you cannot presuppose that we deal with homogeneous units. People evidently do can learn, and I'm different tomorrow than I will be today. You cannot count on the fact that I will act on the same physical laws, the behavioral laws tomorrow as I do today. So if you cannot uh, presuppose homogeneous units, the probability theory simply cannot be employed. So I think reasonings like that would be out of the question. I just wanted to add on that point on standard empiricist view of probability. A pro and, uh, oh, I say on the standard empiricist views of probability theory, since there aren't any connections between necessary connections between one event and another, the a priori, priori probability of any theory is either zero or pretty close to zero, yeah. so it would be impossible to proceed in that way. Chuck? Um, I think that anybody would have to agree with you that the, uh, the track record of the Soviet Union in the Eastern countries is quite clear, uh, poor performance, low standard of living. To that we could add the British case, uh, which accounts for some of the popularity of Mrs. Thatcher. But one exception that has always thrown up in my face when I get into discussions uh, uh, based upon the track record is the Scandinavian experience, in particular Sweden. That's always identified as a country where a tame socialism seems to work. Uh, could you comment on that one, please? I mean, I'm not an, an expert on, uh, on the Swedish uh, situation. Now, one thing I notice is that people normally overestimate the standard of living in countries like Sweden. Um, Sweden had uh, profited from various other factors that other Western European countries who in the meantime have probably surpassed Sweden with respect to its standard of living. But I, according to my estimation, uh, the West German standard of living is probably higher than the Swedish uh, standard of living by now. Uh, that that it took some some while for the West German economy, for instance, to surpass Sweden was due to the fact that West Germany, after the destruction of the war, had to start from um, from a much lower level than the. Swedes who stayed neutral in the war and actually made a lot of money on dealing by dealing uh, very extensively with the Nazis and providing them with um, steel and so on. So a part of the socialist wealth of the of the Swedish economy uh, is due to the fact that they were pretty close collaborators of of national socialism. Oh, I like that one. Just one comment on, on yours, Chuck, is uh, yes, they, they are the model for socialism in that area, but they also have one of the highest suicide rates in the world. <laughs> uh, another, another point is that Sweden is a small country and rests mostly on foreign trade. You know, it's not really socialism in the sense of a large uh, socialist area. So if you're, if, you're, if you're a small country, uh, depending on foreign trade, a lot of your prosperity is due to foreign trade forces, exports. And is there also not an age factor in their demographics? They don't breed much. I'm not familiar with the breeding policy. <laughs> <laughs> they're mating, but they're not breeding. Uh, the MRA in two ways, probably a high standard of living in the world from Capita. Uh, and there are very few people, and they have only a only oil, and the Amir and his relatives have most of the money. I mean, by looking at statistics, typical kind of statistics, they have the highest standard of living per capita. I might, I might add to that. Now, if you look for other small countries who are clearly more capital, more capitalist than Sweden, uh, Switzerland's standard of living is clearly, clearly higher than that of uh, Sweden, and uh, Switzerland is uh, one of one of the relatively most capitalist countries, I guess. Yeah. There's also a, a point about this particular point. I, I don't think it's, it's a point of semantics. Some people might say so, but I don't think so. If I understand correctly, if you actually look at the property ownership, the means of production in Sweden, something like 90 to 94 percent is actually within private hands. So there is, in some sense, still residual claimants for property. And I think colleagues of mine use the term welfare state to describe Sweden as opposed to socialist state, because it is not really a socialist state in the classic sense of the 
the term. Now, whether that whether that's an important difference, uh, yeah. depends. No, so let me just. The point is that 90% of the income, though, is confiscated by the state, with the average tax rate being in excess of 80%. So that, I mean, the private property rights, if you can't enjoy the returns of this private property, is uh, I'm not sure how relevant this is. Well, it, yeah. well, it actually turns out that most of the big producers have big tax breaks. And, uh, <laughs> they can be very successful, like Volvo and those uh, very successful importers actually don't pay those rates. Yeah, I guess we. I mean, uh, we we would probably need some expert on Sweden to inform us about these things. But there, we can't do much more than just uh, speculate out of the top of our head here on this. What? Discussion sounds suspiciously empiricist. Oh no, 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 not at all. As a matter of fact, we, in order to assess the Swedish case. We would have to know, of course, what the institutional setup is in that country. I mean, I can only discuss what the economic consequences will be of what if I know what is what. If, if I don't know what the case is in Sweden, if I only have some very vague general ideas, they have high tax rates, the Social Democrats have been in power forever. Uh, if that is about it, what we, I guess, most of us know about it, uh, then we are not in in too good a position to make uh, precise statements on why the standard of living in that country is as high or not higher than it is. Okay, you. Yeah. Did you say that Karl Marx's theory of capital and in particular the labor theory of value was um, taxiologically Right. I would say that that Marx, as all classical economists, uh, understood economics as some sort of deductive system uh, that they wanted to derive economic laws uh, in a more praxeological style than now uh, eco economists nowadays uh, do this. I mean, he Marx. Uh, uh, perfected Ricardo a little bit. I mean, he took most of his economic ideas directly from Ricardo, and Ricardo was a 95% labor, the labor theory of value theorist, and Marx realized these inconsistencies in, in Ricardo and went all the way and became a 100% labor theory of uh, uh, value theorist. Uh, but indeed, uh, Marx was not in this sense an, an empiricist in the, in the in the sense as we find empiricists in, in, in the economics profession nowadays. But so then does that reflect on a potential danger in praxeology as a way of deriving the theory? No. no, if you just don't think... Uh, uh, that would be... as. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he, he just uh, made he made simple mistakes. I mean, well, um, I mean that that would be that, that would be the same as if you were, were to argue um, must not mathematics be a danger dangerous discipline because they somehow want to derive at rigorous proofs of something. Um, evidently, somebody can claim to be able to provide a rigorous proof that person does not become a dangerous person as such. As a matter of fact, it is much easier to detect, detect the errors of people who have such high claims. And uh, that was essentially done by Böhm Bawerk. He smashed Marx once and for all. I mean, as a theorist. Walter? I would like to agree more and disagree with Murray and Hans on this. I, I think that she's absolutely right that this is uh, an indication of danger of praxeology. Uh, to the extent that he was a praxeologist, and I have no reason to disagree, it just shows that when you start off with the wrong premises, you know, you're driving off into the wrong direction. But this shows, I think, something to the benefit of praxeology, uh, namely that it's not a religion, uh, namely, that there is, uh, that there are mistakes possible made when you use the praxeological method. Yeah, sure. Namely, that you have to have rig rigorous logic. So there is a test of sort. It, it's not a cult or a religion or something that some people have accused of. So I think it, it's, 
I don't think I'm disagreeing with you in principle, but I think she's making a very good point <coughs> to indicate that uh, just because you're a praxeologist, you don't have to I mean, that you could almost argue that it's dangerous to let people think at all because they might end up with mistakes. Um, no. <laughs> We haven't discussed the question of uh, voluntary social uh, Everything that you've said I agree with entirely as applied to coercive socialism, uh, where, where we cannot have any demonstrated preference or revealed preference as to uh, what's going on is what is uh, according to what the consumer wants. However, there are institutions such as the hard right community, the Swiss Family Robinson, the <laughs> <laughs> uh, commune, the co-op, there are many utopias, New Harmony co-op, uh, utopias, type things. Now that, those didn't last too long, but while they last, heterites <laughs> have been a uh, very long-lived uh, kind of voluntary social movement, but even the utopian movement, for while they existed, we as praxeologists have to deduce that there was some sort of demonstrated preference on. Now, uh, the point I would offer is that your analysis is not applied to these voluntary uh, groups because there, there is some sort of demonstrated preference. People can pick up and leave. Now, you might say that it's really some sort of disguised private property. Yeah, I would say that in that case it would be, the, uh, then you can say that the, 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 the unit of a family is evidently not... Uh, uh, the unit of a family is evidently not uh, still in, within the realm of private property, isn't it? I mean, this is, it's a voluntary organization, and uh, they uh, it's like some sort of uh, uh, some sort of contract, uh, um, uh, and allows people to use things uh, jointly. My, I don't claim that my analysis applies to uh, to your. Uh, cited cases of uh, uh, voluntary uh, socialism. As a matter of fact, th th then couldn't you also argue that uh, a stock company is uh, vo voluntary socialism if you pool your assets with other people? Uh, well, that's really right. Right. It's very complicated. I guess it depends upon the caretaker uh, question. And, I mean, in some communes, it might be that if you leave, you can't take one over end of the property with you. In the case of the stock market, obviously, you can quit by selling your share very easily. Uh, so I think it's a very complex kind of an issue. It also has a, uh, a public relations uh, implication as well. Uh, I, I think that many of our uh, intellectual opponents are advocates of centralism. And if we make no distinction between social between the voluntariness of the socialism, you just sort of uh, put socialism in one category, uh, then we remove ourselves from uh, an ability to communicate with them uh, more effectively. Oh, I'm, w I'm willing to make that distinction. No, I'm sure. I'm not saying that, that this is uh, that this is where it's here. I'm just making it as a general point that there is a danger of uh, calling it socialism. I wish I could come up with a better word than coercive socialism, but uh, I myself use that as and uh, the designation of what Mises was proposing. But you see, like, the socialism I dealt with is that which was defined as socialism by, uh, by all major socialist theoreticians. And um, uh, it, it might be more advisable not to use the term socialism for the kind of uh, arrangement that you have in mind and, and keep the terms as they are normally used and as Marxists, for instance, do understand these terms. Murray? I mean, the thing is, there's such a question of, of common usage of language. I mean, we, we can call anything anything we want, you know, company dumpy, I guess. <laughs> we can make anything and anything. But the point is, socialism means in the modern world what Thomas is talking about, course, what you call coercive socialism, Marxism, or whatever. It doesn't mean with the community. I mean, to call that socialism seems to me to mess things up, confuse the public, and then there's so-called public relations. 
Yeah. I'm confused by the answer, but it still seems to me that voluntary socialism is still more or less efficient. So the question is, in maximizing psychic income, these people have chosen security or community over material well-being or whatever, but I don't see where that, that would upset your, your analysis of socialism as an inefficient means of production. Yeah, but then, but they would they would of course maximize other goals than material goals. That is the case, um, and and of course I could say my analysis applies even to those institutions as in so far as I'm concerned with the production of material wealth. Um, but um, if it comes now to this kind somewhat uh, tricky problem of uh, maximizing social social wealth. Uh, where psychic of which psychic psychic wealth is a, a part, then of course I could not make uh, an economic argument against that type of institution because they simply weigh non non material non exchangeable goods uh, less highly as compared with the social benefits that they get from their communal living. Yeah. Yeah. I. Uh... I'd like to extend Walter's argument for voluntary socialism a little further and its implications on the Austrian calculation debate. And that <clears throat> it's clear that display preference isn't, does occur in voluntary socialism. So calculation then can be a part of socialism. The difference is calculation doesn't occur in coerced socialism. So what, what is it? It's not, it's not the socialism that problem. Poses the problem. What it is is the, the, the distinction between coercion and voluntarism. And I'm, what I'm wondering, Hans, is that can we, as praxeologists, uh, develop some method <clears throat> where we can place voluntarism on an upper upper hand, other than using ethics? Can we, through praxeological means, place voluntarism uh, as the obvious goal? Oh. No, as praxeo as praxeologists, we can we cannot defend any kind of goal. As praxeologists, we are exclusively concerned with what are the means appropriate for achieving a given end. But with respect to the end, the praxeologist cannot say anything. So I can say, as praxeologist, if you want to increase wealth, do this or that. If you want to, if you want to have misery and people starve by the millions, then you choose this. Now, then, of course, there's still the problem that there might people do like it if if they die like the flies, and then you, <laughs> and and then, but. As soon as you encounter a person like that, I mean, you might, uh, hopefully, you might not meet very many of those, and then the, <laughs> then the dis discussion will be over as soon as you point out what praxeology can do, choose pass A, and then you will reach such and such a goal. But if you encounter a person like that, then that's the end for economics. That's the end for praxeology, and then the task of ethics sets in. And then the problem is, is there something like a rational ethics? Now, I claim there is something like that. That is one of my special fields, but I'm not here to, to talk about uh, problems like that. I'm, I would be willing to do that to, over a beer. To uh, Hopefully, we get beer again tonight. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Chuck, I'll come to you, just a second. Do you think that the economic changes that have been occurring in China can be taken as a proof of the superior performance of capitalism <clears throat> as an economic system? Um, again, the, the, the problem is, uh, what, what, what do you consider a proof? I mean, I would say they clearly illustrate that uh, capitalism is more, uh, effi more efficient with... with uh, but keeping in mind uh, that an empiricist could always deny everything. Um, but there are proofs of, the, of this, this sort of, of this sort of course, uh, 
all over the world. I mean, uh, the Russians had to give up their war communism and introduce the new economic policy in 23, I think it, uh, it was, uh, because people were simply starving to death. And in order to prevent that, they had to reintroduce elements of a market of a market economy. You look look at the case of uh, Hungary that has now achieved um, uh, what the one of the highest standard of livings within the East Bloc, uh, mainly due to the fact that they introduced ever wider. Uh, uh, possibilities of uh, creating quasi-private property, uh, that they allow firms, private firms to be established provided that they are not too big, that they allow private farmers to farm certain pieces of land provided that the land is not larger than a certain acreage. Uh, so those, those socialist countries uh, that allow more or give uh, that allow more private property rights do better than those countries that don't. Uh, Tom, isn't the key point here that the uh, under socialism economic calculation is impossible, and under capitalism <coughs> the private by uh, free market, uh, uh, me, private property and voluntarily exchanges economic calculation is possible. And that's a praxeological deduced truth, and we don't really have to prove that on the one hand. And then on the other hand, I would argue with the, the voluntary socialist faith who said that uh, it's, uh, e even if it's voluntary socialism, isn't it economic calculation is impossible? Yeah, it's impossible, but, but those people then, of course, choose not to calculate. Yeah, oh, Chuck. I wanted to point out the hermeneutic uh, significance of uh, Walter Block's uh, point, where hermeneutics means what it, would, what it uh, really does mean, which is biblical interpretation. Um, in the debate about uh, social policy in the church, a debate in which uh, I delight in participating, um, uh, it is frequently alleged that the story in the Acts of the Apostles about uh, the, the early Christian community having everything in common is a biblical justification for socialism, but it is precisely Walter's point that gives the lie to that contention, because the primitive uh, Christian community was a voluntary uh, socialist community, uh, as uh, and that certainly is consistent with the whole uh, uh, Christian message, uh, <clears throat> the spirit of the, of the New Testament, the, the, the significance of individual choice and the, the unethical nature of coercion in any form. Exactly. <laughs> to reinforce your point about calculation, uh, in the 1960s, there was a famous or infamous book by Norman Brown uh, called, I think, Love Against Death. And in there, which is a, psych a psychobabble book of the highest nature or lowest nature, anyway, in there, and in the midst of all the psycho battle, he refers to Mises' argument against social, socialist calculation. And he says Mises, Mises was right. In the terrible place where socialism went wrong in the 20th century, they, they, they're trying to counter Mises by, by calculating. And socialism, the, the glory of socialism, he says, never to calculate, never to worry, not, not to worry about economics, to abandon it. And everybody, of course, will starve their community. <laughs> I just wanted to mention two things about the Acts of the Apostles. I know we may be getting away from the text, human action, and other One is that you'll see that material to be distributed as alms is being collected from the members of the Christian community also at a chronologically similar time as a supposed time that all of their possessions are being held in common. So a number of biblical commentators have said, well, this looks like a direct contradiction. How could all their possessions be held in common, and yet things are being collected from them seemingly as private owners to redistribute to others as alms? And so what these commentators have suggested is that 
the supposed statement that the Christians lived in common is actually a sort of a parable type statement. In other words, what it is, is a statement about the friendship and communion of Christians, that the, the kind of spiritual sharing that they held, and that this material communism is just a metaphor, that it was never in fact an institution. And there are actually books, I mean. <laughs> So but I guess for that but, question... But so don't, don't necessarily let a, a pro-socialist Christian claim that this account satisfy, you know, is, is a clear historical example. You can say, no, maybe we need to look further into what the evidence is, what kind of institution they had, <coughs> what the real meaning and purpose of having this account in there was. <laughs> I guess we need a hermeneutician to decide this issue. David Gordon, distinguished theologian. Yeah. <laughs> Born again. I think uh, yeah, you. another point to be made about voluntary socialism is that it is a uh, survival tactic, like in the life boat, <coughs> where someone takes control for the benefit of the group to get them from one point to another, which is that they can uh, go back to individualist freedom as they will. And the early Christian community was an example of a group that was being persecuted. And if they did share in common, it might have only been for a short period of time, but it's not the ideal way to live. Huh. Yeah. Ew. I have to be... I'm sorry I can't just call all, all on you at the same time. I just have to make some choices here. I, I think that you might have missed Mises' essential point on socialism. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it might well be. But just, uh, in, in his article called Economic Calculation and Socialist Commonwealth, remember that? Remember that? Yeah. He, he defines socialism as the complete absence of market institutions. No money, no prices, no property. And he says that Socialism, defined that way, is completely unworkable. And throughout your lecture, you talk about how socialism is, is inferior. And it's not inferior, it just won't work, according to Mises. There's no means for economic calculation. There's no means for anyone to be able to um, distribute the means of production. I mean, I, I made the point that economic calculation is impossible under socialism. Uh, uh, I don't think Mises claimed more than that economic calculation is impossible under socialism. It's, by definition, it is impossible. Socialism as, as a system does not work, and you refer to the Soviet Union as a socialist country, and it's not Mises talked about. Um, oh, I see socialist what you mean. Capitalist countries and interventionists. Oh, okay. And that means. The confusion is the United States is interventionist and the Soviet Union is interventionist. There are no socialist countries. No, no. no. I, I, I wouldn't agree with that. Now, you see, like, what Mises, what Mises did when he. Um, uh, when he made this uh, statement about the impossibility of economic calculation under socialism. He, of course, um, uh, referred to, um, uh, to the original Marxist idea that you have a world socialism. Now, the situation in world socialism, uh, where there are not other countries that have still some sort of capitali capitalist or interventionist um, system, where there are no such other countries, the difficulty is indeed even much, much greater than the difficulty that a single country going on socialism faces. Because countries like the Soviet Union, where most of the means of production are socialized and where indeed with these means of production no calculation can be done, can still somehow refer to world market prices. They can still look, uh, what would this sort of stuff, if I would have it in the uh, in, in in Western countries, what would this roughly cost if I use it now here in the Soviet Union for the same type of purpose? So the fact that the Soviet Union is not much worse off than it already is is due to the fact that they have still capitalist countries or semi 
capitalist countries all around. Without that, uh, the standard of living in the Soviet Union would probably be much lower than it is at the present moment. Well, then, in that case, wouldn't um, Longa's argument of using shadow prices for economic calculation, he can have a, a socialist country, and he can use, um, say, the United States as shadow prices for his country, and that would work. <laughs> yeah, 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 it works as good as shadow prices work, but shadow prices are no prices. I mean, that still does not reflect uh, the price that these things would have at the place where they are. I mean, it is, it is better to have that sort of information than to have to go without that too. But nonetheless, it is all wrong information that they get. Well, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, um, like Sweden and these countries do use market institutions, and that's why they exist at all. Yeah, I mean, the Soviet Union exists too. Yes, it's not, it's not a socialist country as Mises defined it, as I interpret it. Okay. Interpret. I have to, I, I will, will, will reread Mises. I think that's not good. Well, I think from a mainstream institution, I think I can make a point that relates to the, to the mainstream economist respect for capitalism. Uh, unfortunately, Lange's mar market socialism has been accepted by mainstream economists. The, the technical term for that is the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics, saying that uh, if you arbitrarily assign a set of shadow prices, you can attain a Pareto optimal allocation. So, so much for the commitment of neoclassics to, to the free market and capitalism. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, you? Um, one, one thing that comes to mind, this is more of a comment than a question, is given all these tremendously bad things we're discovering about socialism and all the problems it has, which are just blatantly self evident, you know, it becomes a question as to, well, if this is the case, what are people just dumb? Are they blind? Why? Are there so many sympathetic people towards socialism? In my understanding and reading of Marx and things, socialism, as he understood it, applies perfectly to the family unit. You're not a voluntary member of a family as a child. You grew up in it. You can't, you don't have means yourself to decide to opt out and go somewhere else because you simply don't have enough knowledge and experience and that kind of thing and power to do that. So it's a perfect socialist unit. In that sense, it's very psychologically satisfying to have that unit. And everybody who's grown up in a good family, I mean, enjoys that. Now, to try to make this whole thing into a national family is, I mean, this essentially, as I see it, is the goal of many socialists. But the idea is then that they're the fathers, and the idea is to keep everybody else the kids. Right. You know, they don't want to grow up. They want to stay dependent, you know? Give them the money. Keep them dependent. Don't teach them too much. They, they're the kids, you know, and the idea that we'll just take care of them. You read Dostoevsky, the Grand Inquisitor. This is the paradigm. Everybody else is the kids. We are the father, and that's what's best for them. It turns out that's not what's best for the kids. We don't want them to be kids all their life. <laughs> <laughs> subservient to the price mechanism of calculation, but I'm not sure, and that is the separation of ownership and control. I'd like you to comment on that. Item two, would you please comment on the statement, I guess with regard to the Austrian theory of the business cycle, that Orsi socialism is political malinvestment based on ideological inflation. Socialism is political malinvestment based on ideological inflation. <laughs> Well, what, what, what you what you the unit is. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but that might be all right to, to describe it that way. I don't. I think I can't add anything to the second question. But the first, the the, the, the first one with respect, what is the difference between uh, ownership and uh, the right to control? Now, uh, if you assume there are scarce goods and people don't. Uh, by accident agree on what what to do or not to do with these scarce goods if god would have made us in that way that we always happen to agree with respect to everything evidently we wouldn't sit here and discuss how we should do things or do them differently because we were all automatically coordinated um, now, as soon as there are conflicts, we have to decide somehow uh, who is the one who says we do this with that resource and who, who automatically then cannot say it. There are two, the two solutions that capitalism on the one hand and socialism on the other hand chooses is uh, uh, capitalism uses uh, uh, economic means to decide this. It, points out that that person, in case of a conflict, is the one who decides it, who has acquired a thing before somebody else came along, uh, or who has acquired it contractually from a previous owner. He decides, and the other ones like it or not, but that's how it is run. Uh, socialism has to decide that, of course, too. It's not, there's no way that you can get around this problem. It must be decided in, in, in any case. Um, now, if you don't use this mechanism of uh, homesteading and then contractual uh, transfer of uh, property titles, how else can you do it? You can only do it by just, in case of a disagreement, by one person winning out over the other. Now, how can he win out? He can only win out either by... Uh, uh, by being physically stronger, hitting him on the head, or by establishing some sort of voting rights, um, um, majority rule, or basing it on the fact that somebody has a nicer face than somebody else, or whatever it is. But all of these methods, in any case not contractual methods, are called political means. And socialism, the various socialist countries differ in various respects how they organize uh, the, the mechanism through which to find out who is the one who decides. But all of them have in common the fact that they use political means in order to find out who is that one who does it and who, who's, uh, whose opinion will have to be ignored. Yeah, you... One clarification, you said that well, the, 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 the group comes to the conclusion that Marx is a practicological uh, economist, but there are at least eight epistemological foundations for neo-Marxism Marxism today, so there's not, that's not a question that's been clearly defined by the, by the Marxist discipline. The second point, the point that interested me the most about your discussion was the last, the sociological effects. And it seems to me the most important thing that the sociological effects of Marxism have is on time preference and the effects it does when it turns man from economic man to political man, and the effect that it's grab, grab, grab today and forget yeah. about tomorrow. I really didn't get a lot of that out of your discussion in the sociological part. You do you agree with that? Or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, just to, to to give you some sort of indication how that how that works in real life. Um, for a long time, of course, I mentioned this East German, East German, West German um, example because it uh, is um, it comes very close to some sort of social experimentation uh, that you do. Um, and in spite of the fact that the East Germans, of course, make all sorts of efforts not to let people go um, to the West because they want to ha have some people working for uh, <laughs> working for the party. Um, you can, of course, go to the West as soon as you are beyond retirement age because then they don't have to pay the pension or whatever it is that they have to pay. Then they're happy that they're gone. Nonetheless, you have uh, small numbers of people who come from uh, from the east to the west, either because they escape or they are bought out or some something like that. Now, the the difficulty is that these people have adapting to a different sort of life is quite tremendous. Uh, it happens quite frequently, as a matter of fact, that people return after a few years 
it's a small number of people, most of them of course stay, there is a small number of people that actually returns because they cannot deal with the situation where you have to make your own decisions, uh, where you have to, um, uh, where you have to just uh, um, stand on your own feet and are not constantly told by various people what to do and what not to do. In the United States, I hear you have the same sort of problem with uh, with Russian Jews coming to uh, Russian Jews coming to the states. Again, the overwhelming majority of these people stays, but um, because of the deformation of the character that takes place in societies like the East Bloc, some people simply are unable to make it in, in, in a more competitive environment um, where productive skills and not political skills are in, in demand and return back to, uh, to Russia because of that.